The modern state of Turkey covers an area of nearly 300,000 square miles. In parts it is rich and green and very fertile. In others it is dry and barren as a desert. In the east on the high plateau where it borders Russia, winters are bitterly cold. In the southwest, the climate is warm and typically Mediterranean. Although this land has been, for 3,000 years, the heart of many empires, the center of power and wealth, it was in 1923 a poor country. In that year of its founding, the new republic faced all the problems that must be solved in underdeveloped countries. Today, Turkey is a nation in transition. Within four decades, it has become the most western of all the Muslim states. The extreme contrast to be seen throughout the country prove how much may be accomplished in a short time, and yet how little. They show how long a time it takes for growth and change and progress, and prove how hard it is to bring prosperity and democracy to a people who have never known either. In 1923, roughly 90% of all Turks were peasants, and they lived for the most part in remote and isolated communities where, as in other underdeveloped countries, social and economic conditions had changed very little since biblical times. Life is brutally hard in a Turkish village. The simplest human needs are difficult to satisfy, and nothing really counts from day to day but dogged human labor. Here, productivity, the key to prosperity in the modern world, is limited to what you can do with your bare hands. In America, a single farmer may produce enough food for himself and 20 others. When agriculture is primitive, it may take the full time of each man, woman, and child to produce enough for themselves alone. 77% of the Turkish people are still on the land. For many of them, life has not changed in any significant way.
For a handful of others, a single tractor has made all the difference. At this stage of the nation's growth, a tractor may change a peasant into a businessman farmer. Estimates show that six million additional Turkish acres could be cultivated if modern tools were available. Even lacking such tools, Turkey has made progress. By 1939, with land reforms and new techniques introduced by President Kemal Ataturk, the nation produced enough food for its own needs and a surplus for export. Since then, the hazards of climate and war have upset this favorable balance. But Turkish melons, figs, raisins, and hazelnuts from the Black Sea coast are still shipped to many parts of the world. More and more Turkish cotton is offered on the world market, and its sale helps bring to the nation the money it must have if it is to continue to grow and to prosper. With the help of foreign specialists, some of whom were first brought to the nation by Ataturk, livestock and techniques of animal husbandry have been greatly improved. Turkish wool may still be spun and woven on antiquated wheels and looms. The craft of rug making may not have changed much, but all such crafts are of considerable importance to the nation's economy. The silk industry is growing. Modern textile plants have been built. And soon, at the end of this period of economic transition, it may not be necessary for Turkey to spend its capital for imports of fabrics and yarns. Tobacco remains the nation's most important crop for export, especially to America. From the small farm where the peasant harvests and dries it in the sun, some of it goes to modern factories which turn out 26 billion cigarettes a year. To move its crops to market, Turkey must still rely heavily upon backbreaking human labor and upon the strength of animals. In 1923, the nation's railway system was meager owned by foreigners and designed to serve their interests. Now it is state-owned and has been widely extended, but not nearly enough. And there is a desperate need for highways and for hard surface roads. The interior of the country is reported to be rich in natural resources, but these resources cannot be worked until there are roads that lead to them. Even further agricultural development is critically linked with the need for an adequate transportation system. Without roads, crops remain where they are grown. Since the war, much American aid has gone to road building in Turkey, but most of this aid has been used for military highways. Much of any nation's progress and prosperity depends upon the discovery and exploitation of its natural resources. Wealth, in the form of such minerals as chrome, of which Turkey is one of the world's principal producers, may lie unnoticed. The Turks have discovered and are now producing coal, lignite, manganese, and many other minerals, including petroleum. <laughs> But their economy is still based upon agriculture. Farm products are their main exports, and the foreign ships which crowd the Turkish ports must bring iron and steel and machinery. And recently, owing to drought, even wheat has had to be imported. For all 
the underdeveloped countries. Dams, flood control, hydroelectric power and irrigation are vital to progress. 10 million acres of Turkish land wait for irrigation. Six major hydroelectric projects have been started, but they are long-term investments, costing millions, and the people must wait many years before they can enjoy their full benefits. Of all the wealth and power of the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish people saved almost nothing but their great mosques and their traditional ways. And it is a traditional society that is slowest to change. It is a tremendous undertaking, Ataturk said, to awaken a sleeping people. But this is what in 1923 he set out to do. The word Islam means acceptance, resignation to the will of God. For Ataturk, the visible signs of this attitude of resignation were the Turkish man's fez and the Turkish woman's veil. In his words, they were signs of ignorance, of fanaticism, of hatred against progress and civilization. In 1925, he outlawed the fez and the veil. He separated his government from the Muslim religion and began the modern education of his people. the eyes of the Imam, the Muslim teacher, an educated man is one who can recite the Quran from memory, even if he does not know what it means. Before 1923, almost no other kind of education was available, and 90% of all the Turks were illiterate. Today, perhaps 50% of them are still illiterate. To teach an entire nation to read and to write is a gigantic task. These young soldiers are in a classroom for the first time in their lives, for they had no education in their remote villages. Now they have a chance to go on to trade and to industrial schools, which have been set up throughout the country. But it is not likely that many of them will become the skilled technicians and administrators the underdeveloped country needs.
Within four decades, many young Turks have been educated and trained in medicine and in the sciences. But there is still a critical lack, which the World Health Organization and UNICEF helped to meet by sending medical specialists and by setting up modern milk processing plants, where perhaps for the first time, Turkish women may find safe milk for their children. Ataturk initiated a vast health program. Between 1923 and 1937, the Turks built hospitals and founded medical schools. But UNICEF aid is still necessary in combating malaria and trachoma. Although it is a relatively underpopulated country, Turkey has one of the highest birth rates in the world. As the mortality rate declines, more and more children must be cared for and educated, and at its present stage, Turkey must spend a goodly portion of its income simply to hold on to what has been gained in education. Today, 50% of its children have little hope of learning to read and write. Those who can go to school learn to read and write their language in the Roman alphabet. Traditionally, their language was written in the Arabic script. As he replaced the Muslim calendar by the Western, Ataturk replaced Arabic writing by the Roman. And it is now used for all books to give Turkish students easier access to the knowledge of the West. Today, the Turkish child may begin his study in a one-room schoolhouse, often built by the villagers themselves. A few will go on to study in secondary schools, in trade and technical schools, and in universities in Ankara and in Istanbul. The new Middle Eastern Technical University, a joint project of Turkey and the United Nations Special Fund, will soon be sending its graduates to vital projects throughout the Middle East. There's a new class of young and vigorous intellectuals in Turkey, but there is a gulf between them and the mass of the people. Ideals of service and of community responsibility are new to them, as they are to many other people throughout the world. So far, very few educated Turks have been willing to go as teachers, doctors, nurses, into the remote villages of their country, where the need is so great. Over the entrance to the Turkish parliament, there are inscribed the words, all power emanates from the people. The Turkish democracy was founded on this principle. The new republic adopted a constitution, a bill of rights and codes of law and justice based on Western models, promising liberty and freedom to all its citizens. For the first time, Turkish women were free to take their rightful place in society. Today, no job and no profession is closed to them. And they play an increasingly important role in the nation's politics. The Republic itself, being young, has not yet put fully into practice the principles upon which it was founded. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press have often been severely curtailed. Lately, the political scene has been violent, and it continues to be unstable. The economy is shaky bolstered by millions in American aid. In recent elections, 90% of the eligible population, both literate and illiterate, went to the polls and made another attempt in the long and difficult process of learning to govern themselves.
throughout its history, Turkey's geographical position has destined it to be a bridge between East and West and a battleground. The Bosporus and the Dardanelles are among the world's most strategic waterways. Many foreign powers, especially Russia, have sought control of them. Today, the Turkish army, made up of some of the world's best fighting men, must be kept constantly on the alert at tremendous cost to the nation and to the West. Kemal Ataturk came up out of the army of the Ottoman Sultans to lead his country into the modern world and to be called its father. He was a highly controversial figure, but his ideals, his vision, his deep insight into his nation's people and its problems shaped Turkey's history and achievements. His dream for his nation remains vivid, but there is still a long way to go before it becomes a reality. Ataturk died in 1938. Every year since, on the anniversary of his death, the Turkish people have observed a moment of silence in his honor. 